Um, okay, well, we'll get started with the stuff that we had been doing, which was electronic materials and bonding, uh, uh, level one bonding, which is bonding to the semiconductor. Within the semiconductor, there are bonds, but we're not going to go into that. That's kind of vapor deposition stuff. We talked about wire bonding, where you can get 200 to 400 I.O. and tab bonding, and I handed out a tab tape uh, to each of you. Uh, tab bonding, where you can get 400 to 800 I.O., and this is called perimeter bonding. You know, I'll go back to the next one in a second. But in wire bonding, I've got about a one centimeter square chip, and I have some little square pads made out of aluminum or gold, depending on the chip. And I'm going to squeeze the wire as a thermal compression weld. We've talked about it, how you basically are forging this little uh, small wire against there, and you get about three times the diameter of the wire. So you get interfacial sliding, and you get essentially a cold weld. There's something on the order of 10 to the 12th of those welds made each year in the world. In tab bonding, well, the, let me back up. This is perimeter bonding because you go all the way around the perimeter, and if you have one centimeter and it takes about seven thousandths of an inch, uh, you've got four, um, four tenths of an inch, and so you can get about, how do I do that? Um, yeah, you, um, you can get about 200 or so. Um, yeah, you can get about 50 on a side. So it's 200, it's uh, four, four tenths of an inch, 1.6 inches around, uh, divided by, point, by 0 0.007, and that's about 200 bonds going around this. You can double it and have a second row inside. Now you're losing real estate on your semiconductor, um, but uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Tab bonding is essentially a similar type of thing, except in having, instead of having a mechanical connection, you're actually going to solder these together. And typically, it'll be a gold pad, and you'll uh, have some tin on the tape. The tape may be gold or copper, or, um, but it'll have tin on the, plated on the very outside surface. And gold and tin form a low-melting alloy that uh, you basically can solder with. And so you're soldering, and all you have to do is come down with a heated platen, which could be tungsten or, or molybdenum. Uh, I said tungsten the other day, mostly because... I think it was Intel, might have been another company that I was visiting, and they're very secretive of what it, what it was, but uh, I could tell it was tungsten. Molybdenum may be better in some ways, because molybdenum has better thermal diffusivity, but we'll talk about thermal diffusivity later um, in this course. Um, in any case, you can get, since it's only about four thousandths, and you've got four hundred thousandths on the side, you've got a hundred around the side, you've got four hundred. If you do a double layer, you can get eight hundred. Now, the Last one, which is coming more and more into its own, um, is control collapse chip connection. It was invented in the 1960s by IBM, but it wasn't really needed until the last 10 years. And it's called C4 for obvious re reasons. Who wants to go around talking about, well, I was working on control collapse chip connection um, all the time. Essentially, instead of being a perimeter bond, it's a way of area bonding, uh, and you can get up to 1,000 or 2,000 I.O. input-outputs uh, connections to your chip. Here's your silicon chip, um, and what you're going to do is you can have smaller pads, and they can be across the whole area. So you actually have to you lose real estate, but it's not all on the outer diameter, you leave some of these little pads in the middle of your chip. Um, and if you're looking down on the chip, this is sideways on the chip. So here's your substrate, which is some form of aluminum oxide, typically. And you're going to have little solder balls. And those solder balls might be 10 mils in diameter. You certainly can have um, 30 by 30, and that's going to give you 1,000. Uh, you can have smaller solder, solder balls, and you have little pads here that are, again, uh, gold. The, the balls may be tin or indium tin, or in the old days they used to be lead tin uh, solders, but people were trying to get the lead out. So uh, anyway, you have a low-melting 
ball here, which alloys with the uh, solders as you heat it up. And the balls all have to be very uniform diameter. The whole thing is self-aligning by surface tension because the balls want to, uh, to follow right on the, uh, the, uh, the pad that they're on. In fact, sometimes people will take, let's say, a high melting ball, I'll just call it lead, and they'll put a lower melting alloy like tin around that, and then they'll put it to this gold substrate. And now you'll have, when you, when you actually melt it, you're going to have some wetting and a true solder, and the ball actually doesn't melt. But it's, it's a soft metal, it's a low melting metal, and therefore it'll take up thermal strain. Because I have a serious problem, we talked about that. I can have up to 10, or 10 to 30 watts per square centimeter that I have to pull out of this thing. One of the advantages of these processes is that the chip is directly on the substrate. In this case, the chip is insulated from the substrate. So typically in something like this, on C4, I come back in with some sort of copper heat sink up here to pull the heat off of this thing. But I have to be careful about some of that because I sometimes end up leaving, uh, having circuits up there. And people are talking about putting circuits on both sides of the chip. Okay, and so design gets more and more complex. That people are talking about have been working over the last 10 years. I don't know anything's been commercialized, but layering chips. So you have a three dimensional array, just like in a circuit board. But the silicon will be in layers with chips in between, you know, with transistors in between. I mean, when you're getting to 42 million uh, transistors on a chip, you're looking for real estate anywhere you can. Yeah. Well, actually, you do lose some usable real estate. It's not all on the perimeter. You've distributed it throughout. And these pads can get smaller. I mean, they, this is, some of these balls get down to 004 for the ball and the actual contact area. I haven't drawn it, drawn it very well. But the pad can get even smaller. But you actually do continue to lose some real estate on these things. I mean, you're going to have to lose real estate to make connections. Um, it's just a question of, how you distribute it, okay? Now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this whole thing would be encapsulated afterwards, typically in an epoxy type of polymer type compound. But yeah, it's, the whole thing is, you gotta protect it from corrosion. It doesn't take much to corrode these things. In fact, corrosion a few years ago was the biggest problem. If I went back 10 years ago, as things were getting smaller and smaller, it doesn't take very long to corrode through something that's only two, two to four thousandths thick. You know, and if I went back 20 years ago, we were talking about 15 or 20 thousandths bonds. And so, yeah, it might take six or seven years. But now when you get down to two thousandths, any corrosion that occurs. And they were originally starting just to put some, some plastic protector over it. I mean, just pour some, some liquid polymer that would harden up. But the permeability of the water through that was a serious problem. And there was a, 10 years ago, there was a big research consortium here at MIT with IBM and digital equipment and a number of other, Motorola and some others, trying to figure out how to control the, the moist, moisture just, dissolve, uh, just diffusing through the polymer. I mean, you, it wasn't as if you had a break in your seal, it was just kind of going through. It doesn't take very much moisture, as far as that goes. Yep. It's, it's basically the same process. Um, those tab tapes that I gave you, um, the, they go back to Pentium 1, which is what, 1992 or 93 or something like that. Um, and so back in those, at that time, uh, 92, 93, 94, people were starting to say, okay, I because I don't want to lose the real estate on my printer circuit board of having this big aluminum oxide container for this little one centimeter square chip, I'm going to mount the chip directly on the circuit board. I'm going to get rid of that extra layer of packaging of that aluminum oxide. First of all, it's making Kyocera rich, okay, because they're charging me a, a hundred bucks a package 
because it's got all this gold and all these fancy layers and everything. There's reliability problems if I can get rid of that and just go directly to the printed circuit board. So they were going to, um, the reason those tab tapes are, are like they are is because Intel will sell you the chip like that with the inner lead bonds made, but not the outer lead bonds. You make the outer lead bonds directly to the printed circuit board, okay? And then you have to encapsulate it with the plastic. Uh, there is no real difference between ball grid array, which is what people typically talked about for putting the chip directly to the package. Now, when they talk about, uh, conceptually there's no difference. When they talk about ball grid array, they typically were talking about taking this whole package and then putting balls down here. Now I have a lot more area and those balls are bigger. Those balls might be a half a millimeter in diameter, 20 thousandths. Uh, but then I got, I have a connection here, I have a connection here, you know, I got more and more connections and any one of them that fails then I've lost my, my circuit, right? So sometimes it's called ball grid array. C4 is really specifically silicon to its substrate. It used to be you then take this package and by ball grid array, which is the same thing, you take the package and put it to the substrate, to the printed circuit board. Then people said, well, I'm going to eliminate the package. I'm just going to go chip to substrate. And so it gets a little fuzzy about what's C4 and what's ball grid array when you start eliminating one of the, one of the levels. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that this input-output was a big problem back with Pentium 1s and Pentium 2s. I think Pentium 2s were like 10 million chips or 10 million transistors or 8 million or something. And Pentium 1s were three or four million or something on a chip. The, um, and in fact, the Pentium 2, I remember, was two chips in one package. I remember seeing it uh, at Intel back 95 time frame or whatever, right before it came out. Um, and the, the problem is you can't, um, you can't make anything bigger than about a centimeter because thermal expansion kills you. If I make it two centimeters, my thermal strains are twice as great, and I'll just shear right through these things. Uh, or, or it, well, I'll shear through those things, or if this thing's bonded directly to its substrate, I'll get stresses in the, in the semiconductor that'll crack the brittle semiconductor. So, because of our inability to, to bond and dissipate heat like we'd like, you really don't get bigger than about a centimeter on a side for a chip. Now, as we've gotten smaller and smaller, and we start to get to 42 million transistors on a chip, you get to the point where Rent's rule starts to break down. Obviously, if you could put everything in a computer on one chip, you would have a significant advantage in your I.O. Rent's rule, which tells you that you have a certain fraction of I.O. per number of transistors, starts to break down because now all the connections are on the chip and you only have to have 10, 15, 20, 1,000, I don't know what the number is because everything is sitting on that chip. Um, I know the Defense Department has worked on two inch diameter chips where you basically put a whole system on a chip. Now there's some reasons for that and some of the reasons for that have to do with the speed of transmission. And it doesn't, you don't have to get too sophisticated to start figuring out what the uh, problems are as you get smaller and smaller, or not necessarily smaller and smaller, but you try to go faster and faster. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And if I've got a centimeter chip, the, uh, and I know that the wavelength is equal to the speed times time, is that right? Um, I can go through this, and I have 3 times 10 to the 8th, which is my velocity. And let's say I divide that by 3 gigahertz, and I'm going to end up with... 10 to the minus 8 meters, which is 0 0.01. Let me see. 0 0.01 millimeters, which is um, 
oh, micrometers, sorry, which is which is um, 10 nanometers. Okay, 10 nanometers is only a thousand angstroms. Um, we are starting to well. That basically says that the fastest the even if the electrons were going at speed of light, which they're not. Uh, I start in with these types of clock speeds, and let's face it, I just uh, you know was looking at some Dell mailing, and they they're selling a two gigahertz Pentium chip now, Pentium four. I mean, most of them are 1.6 or 1.7, but they had one that was two gigahertz. So you're approaching three gigahertz. And now you start looking at distances, and you realize that in that clock speed, I can't even get off the chip with that signal. So the signals have to be processed on the chip, because at that clock type of clock speed, everything's got to be fairly close together. Now, it gets even worse than that. It turns out that um, you don't go at the speed of light. What is it that keeps you these electrons from moving? I mean, they might be an order of magnitude slower than that. Anybody know what the problem is? Well, they have mass, yeah. The mass keeps them from going at 95 or 98% of the speed of light, but they're only going about 10% of the speed of light. And it has to do with the, the capacitance. There's not a tremendous amount of inductance, but the capacitance on the chip. Basically, they get slowed down by the reactance of the circuit. It's a high-frequency circuit, and it's going to be influenced by the electric fields and a large part of chip design. In fact, the big fancy Alpha chip, which was made out here in Hudson, Massachusetts, ten years ago when they came out, and I don't remember, they were trying to run up towards the gigahertz. But a, a big, a big part of that was they had done the electromagnetic design of that chip to keep the keep the the capacitance down. Whenever I have two conductors separated by an insulator, that's a capacitor. Well, I got all kinds of capacitors all over this chip, and that slows down the uh, the transmission. Now, you're, I'm getting way out, way out of my field, but in fact, that becomes one of the limiting things. Um, we are reaching a limit there. Um, now, I was just reading in Technology Review last night that uh, one of the ways around this is to go to clockless computers. Um, and some guy at Caltech in 1989 developed the first clockless chip. And so now, instead of having a clock that tells all the bits when they're supposed to march in line and that you can now do something, you basically kind of send packets of information through. And you have one part of your processor process that information. And when it's finished processing, it sends a signal saying, OK, you know, it's ready for the next step. But it's not determined by a clock that's telling everything when to switch. And supposedly, they built some of these things, and they give a factor of two or three increase in speed. So that's good. But there are limits, OK? And I remember five years ago, Craig Barrett, who's now CEO of Intel, gave a, a lecture here at MIT. And he said that in 1995, he said, basically, we're going to run out of miniaturization in about 2005. Now, I don't know what the prediction is now. Maybe this is like the price of oil, and you're always 20 years ahead. But in fact, there are physical limits. And um, you're going to find that, well, we're already finding a, a, a more important an economic li limit uh, or a practical limit. People don't care too much about getting a 2 gigahertz computer. It's only my graduate students who have to have the fastest computer to do word processing, OK? I mean. <laughs> Most people are only doing word processing. And if you're number crunching, but relatively few people are really number crunching. Now, my, Chris will say that you know my students actually are number crunching. Um, they're running CAD programs or something like that. And some of the time, they are. Most of the time, they're word processing, or they're doing some sort of PowerPoint presentation or something. You don't need a 100 megahertz computer for, for something like that. But you'd like to have it, right? You'd like to have the, uh, the 2 gigahertz. So it's just, you know, wanting to have the biggest, the fastest, it's just kind of an ego thing. Uh, and, in, and those of us, actually, it was kind of a shock to the, you know, over the years, it used to be I had to have three types of computers in the lab. I had to have a VAX, I had to have a PC, and I had to have a Mac. Because different, you know, they all had different capabilities. It's getting blurry now. 
about, and it actually started getting blurry about five, five to eight years ago, about what a Mac could do that a, a PC couldn't do. Because PCs, it's a lousy operating system, and Microsoft has you know, done a great disservice to the world by, by uh, the way they've, they've handled things. But, um, and, I mean, you know, you don't, we learned from Linux, you don't have to have a system that crashes all the time. The reason Microsoft crashes all the time is because they're protecting themselves. Okay, they they basically are running background checks all the time to make sure you're not pirating some of their 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 technology or their code or whatever, and therefore they crash every now and then. If they weren't worried about losing the rights to some of their code, they wouldn't be running these background checks all the time, and your computer wouldn't crash. And why do people hate Microsoft? Okay. They hate them for the same reason the, some, some Muslims don't like the United States. It's a similar type of thing is because they're always doing something that's hurting them. And, you know, so they, they are always trying to pirate Microsoft. I think someone told me Microsoft updates its, uh, its virus protection system hourly or something. Okay, because people are always trying to create viruses to, to punish Microsoft for their operating system. And if you, if, if you know anything about Linux, Linux, is it Linux? Linux. Um, it doesn't doesn't crash, you know. Why? Because they're not running these background checks in the, all the time um, to try to keep uh, things from from crash uh, from uh, keep people from uh, stealing their technology because it, they're, they're open systems. Any case, um, any questions on? Uh, we're gonna get, when we get to soldering, we'll talk some more about printed circuit boards and wave soldering and how you do levels two and three, but. Basically, unless there's other questions, I'll go on to adhesive bonding. Any other questions on bonding on the semiconductor chip? Oh, oh okay. <clears throat> Actually, what you want is that one. That one needs to go up there. There's a trick to using these three-layer boards. You start with the middle one, okay? And then you throw it up and pull the top one down. Okay? But anyway. Took me a couple months to learn that. Um, well, if you start with the, the outer one, and you, uh, how is it? Yeah. If you start with the one on the outside, you can throw it up, but then when you pull the other one down, and you want to write on the third board, you end up covering up the second board that you just did, and so the students who haven't caught up on note taking have problems. Anyway. Um, so there's a fundamental limitation to the speed. Let's go on to adhesive bonding. And adhesive bonding is unique among the welding and joining processes because it's the only one that doesn't get rid of the contamination on the surface. Adhesive bonding is the only one that just buries the contamination. Um, and I used to bring a book that was written by a very famous uh, research laboratory in upstate New York. The company, we just call it Company X, keep it uh, um, quiet, but they make copying machines. Uh, there are two companies in upstate New York that make copying machines. One is Company K and the other one is Company X. Um, anyway, and I used to bring the book in and I would open it up and it would talk about, it was fundamentals, it's written by people from this, this laboratory. And for copying machines, you have to, you're basically adhesively bonding a little piece of polystyrene and carbon black, which is your toner, to a piece of paper. And so they're interested in adhesion. And it starts out and talks about the fundamentals of adhesion. It starts out with gluons. Anybody know what gluons are? Gluons are the parts that hold quarks together, okay? Now, this is kind of going a little too far back to the fundamentals, so I didn't bring it today, but I used to bring the book, and I'd read from the book, and, and I'd throw it in the trash, okay? And then I'd always have to retrieve it out of the trash, so the next year I could throw it in the trash. Um, but in, in fact, people go back, and, and people go back to, and the reason I didn't bring it is because I've realized that to a certain extent I've done the same thing. Um, when I start out the first day, and draw you the Leonard Jones potential, where we talk about the, uh, oh, that's lousy Leonard Jones. Um, 
where we talk about the bond energy as a function of radius and two atoms coming together. And if you go to almost any scientific book, almost any, not any, but almost any, scientific book on adhesive bonding, that's where they start. Now, it's not inappropriate, in my opinion, to start there when you're talking about cold welding, because in cold welding, I'm going to get rid of the contamination, and I'm going to have metal-metal or ceramic-ceramic or polymer-polymer contact with no contamination. And in fact, the strength of the bond is going to be related to that binding energy between two atoms of the same type. However, in adhesive bonding, why do I even start talking about that? You can, you can rip out the first chapter in most of these books, which goes back to this kind of fundamental, because it doesn't relate to adhesive bonding. In adhesive bonding, I've got a surface, and the surface is contaminated. It'll have oxides. On top of the oxides, it might have some absorbed CO2 from the atmosphere. On top of that, it'll always have water vapor. Unless you're, even in Arizona, where the humidity is low, there's a layer of water on everything. Well, it may only be a monolayer or a couple of monolayers. Here in New England, it's tens of monolayers. You've got a lot of water on that surface because water has a lower surface energy than the oxide. The oxide has a lower surface energy than the metal, if we're talking about a metal. And so these things are going to contaminate the surface. The metal can lower its surface energy by forming a metal oxide on the surface. It takes 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 6 seconds, however long it takes at atmosphere for a metal, for a metal to grow an oxide of film on the surface. It takes a few other microseconds for it to build up a layer of CO2 and water vapor on the surface from the air. And in New England, and you can, we can't see the water, but there's a layer of water on this table. There's a layer, well, we always we know we have water on our hands, but that actually comes from the fact that we're 98% water ourselves. In any case, all we do in adhesive bonding is cut, bury the contamination. In order to do that, we have to have something that has a lower surface energy. We talked before about Teflon, and the question came up, how do you bond to Teflon? It's a problem bonding to Teflon. Teflon, the, the fluorocarbons have the lowest surface energies that we can measure. And because of that, there's nothing else that wants to bond to them. There's nothing else that can go on the surface and lower their surface energy. So in fact, most surfaces are layers of different la levels of contamination that increasingly are lowering the surface energy of something. And in fact, um, well, let's, let's get to, um, the, there's, I call it two types, and I'm the only, this is kind of my terminology. I talk about type 1 adhesive bonding, and type 1 adhesive bonding is not the Leonard-Jones potential of bringing two atoms together. Well, it is in a sense, because when I have a layer of water flow over and wet a, and we're going to talk about wetting in a second, um, and wet the surface of something, it's, there is a chemical bond that occurs there, but now it's Van der Waals bonding. And it's the water Van der Waals bonding to whatever the substrate is. If it's a nice piece clean of piece, clean piece of glass, it's water which actually more, might form a hydrated bond to the oxide surface. And so you got some sort of silica, silicon hydrate or silicate. It's a hydrated silicate, as far as that goes. Uh, but that's not what. So fundamentally, you can say that's it. But we. We can't calculate anything with this for adhesive bonding because we really don't know what the top layer of contamination is. An easier way is to take a more macroscopic view. And it turns out if I took two pieces of solid for type 1 bonding and I interpose a liquid and the liquid wets the surface, so here's my liquid in between. It turns out there will be a force of attraction. And if the separation distance is d and the radius, I can just call that radius of curvature r. It's not necessarily a constant, but I can approximate it as spherical. It turns out you can calculate the, uh, the pressure differential 
in the liquid minus the pressure in the air, and that's going to be equal, delta P is equal to the surface tension or surface energy times the curvature. The curvature is often given by kappa. A, um, I'll, let, me go, let me just write it down here first. So here I have the surface energy between the liquid and the vapor, and that times 1 over big R, where big R is, I'm going to bond a disk, it'll have a diameter of 2R, 1 over big R minus 1 over little r, and that is the delta P of the pressure inside this liquid to the pressure outside. Okay, there's going to be a pressure differential because of the surface curvature. Now, how do I know that that equation I wrote over there is true? Well, if you took physical chemistry as a sophomore, you'd learn this, but in fact, soap bubbles. Soap bubbles obey this equation. Delta P is equal to the surface energy times the curvature. Small soap bubbles have very high pressures inside them. Large soap bubbles have a lower pressure. Now, you don't necessarily know that from forming bubbles, but you do know it from blowing up balloons. If you blow up a balloon, it takes a lot of pressure to get it started when it's small. But it doesn't take anywhere near as much pressure once it gets big, right? So you do all this stretching of the balloon and everything and, and, uh, and puff on it real hard. But it's getting over that, that initial small curvature because delta P is 1 over the radius of curvature. For a spherical balloon, it's 1 over R squared. Okay. For um, the curvature of two surfaces in general, R1 over R1 and one plus 1 over R2, where R1 and R2 are the two principal radii of curvature. So if I have a cylinder only has one radius of curvature, and that's the, the radius of the cylinder. In the other dimension, it's 1 over infinity, which is 0, right? So um, the pressure differential for a spherical bubble is gamma divided by 2r, 2 gamma over r. For a cylinder, it would be a cylindrical bubble, would be just gamma over r. The curvature is 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2. Well, how do I get up with this minus sign in here? I get the minus sign is because I have to define my origin here. And if big R is positive going there, little r is going to be negative because it's outside. OK? The, if I define my coordinate system as the center axis, little r is pointing inward towards the center axis. And so it's minus little r. So I have a pressure differential of gamma, the surface energy of the liquid, 1 over big R minus 1 over little r. It turns out that if little r is, is uh, approximately d over 2, this term essentially is on the order of 0. This is the dominant term. And so my pressure differential is minus gamma LV over R or close to it, okay? I have a negative pressure inside that liquid if it's a wetting liquid. If it's not a wetting liquid, I have a positive pressure and it's above atmospheric pressure. Um, in fact, it can, the negative pressure can actually go below atmospheric pressure. Now we can prove this is true by going to a set of Johansson blocks. Anybody know what Johansson blocks are besides Chris? Machinists use these to measure the, and the problem is my hands have got chalk cuts on them right now, but I'll try to make this work. Um, machinists use Johansson blocks, and these are worth about 100 bucks a piece. These are three-inch blocks, three inches plus or minus 50 micro inches at 72 degrees centigrade, or at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees centigrade roughly, okay? And these are, these happen to be chromium carbide blocks. You can get hardened steel blocks, and I've got some in there, but they rust. Um, so 
these are very precisely ground blocks, parallel and uniform in length to about 50 millionths of an inch um, per inch. Now, these are chrome and car carbide, and they've got some chips taken out of them, so they don't work quite as well as they used to. That's because of the way I use them. A machinist will have a whole set of these. I mean, I've got a set here. This, these are two-inch blocks. Uh, these are some of my old steel blocks. They come, you know, a machinist will have a big set of these things. And if they want to know, they don't want to just know something within a thousandth of an inch for which they can use micrometers. Uh, if they want to know something within tenths of an inch or even less, they're going to have to go and set up and calibrate and know what things are and measure the temperature of things because these things will change their length by more than 50 millionths of an inch over 10 degrees. Tenth is one ten thousandths, right. So it turns out a machinist will ring these together and slide them together. And if you do that, they adhere, they adhere. And in fact, you can turn them and have a smaller area of contact. There's adhesion. Now, what adhe adhesive did I use? What liquid? You saw me. I was rubbing my greasy hands on there, right? Now, the problem is I had to be careful because just the chalk dust is thicker. These things have a, a very good finish on the end. And just the chalk dust is enough to screw this up. And there have been years when I did this in front of the class and I could barely get them to bond because I ended up getting chalk dust on the surface. But in fact, I can do it like that. So you can pass them around. You can drop them and chip them. Uh, it's not a big deal. Here's another set if people want to. Um, but you have to ring them together. slide them together, and there's a very thin layer of liquid, and that's type 1 adhesive bonding. Okay, now type 2, and we'll get to some more of the type 1. Um, type 2 is <coughs> mechanical interlocking. And in mechanical interlocking, basically I just have a rough surface and another rough surface, and I interpose some liquid, and if the liquid hardens up, a lot of my adhesives will harden over time. If it hardens up, I have a mechanical liquid, a mechanical bond. Um, so it turns out, I'd say over 90% of the bonding in the world, adhesive bonding, is actually just mechanical interlocking. And there was the question that came up before, well, how do you bond Teflon to pots? And I said, well, one thing they can do is they just roughen up the aluminum pan by sanding it. Now I have a rough surface, and I spray on the Teflon, and it mechanically interlocks. In really good pots, I told you about Millennium Cookware, they plasma spray on a stainless steel powder, and they, uh, the powder is very porous, but the little individual particles are welded together, and now I infiltrate, under pressure, the Teflon into that porous structure, so it's like a sponge, and then the te Teflon solidifies, and it's mechanically interlocked. There's no big surface tension. I have to have a low surface tension, because how could I infiltrate it in those little pores unless I had a low surface energy and those things wanted to bond? In fact, um, I told you before about magic sand. I happen to bring my, I gotta go to the store and see if I can get any more magic sand. But this is blue magic sand. It comes in different colors. And you need to have some water. So I have some water. And I pour, maybe I pour too much water in there. It's non toxic, so you can drink it. Um, but if you, in fact, you pour some of it out. Too much water. I'm going to pass this around so you can play a little bit with the magic sand. If you need some more water, you can come up and get it. But if I'd had a clear thing, but if I take the sand out, it's dry. It's a 
pull the sand out of the water and it's dry and it flows. Okay. This magic sand is getting old, some of it. Some of it floats on top. It's a mess. I can see why mothers never and fathers never wanted to let their kids play with this stuff because it's blue sand all over the house. Um, plus that, they charge like six bucks a, a bottle for it. Uh, but in any case, you have to have something that wets something else in order to have either type 1 or type 2. But type 2 is the most common type of bonding. Much more common than type 1, but they both exist. I just proved to you that uh, type 1 exists by passing around the Johansson blocks. Um, to understand wetting, we have Young's equation, or sometimes called the Young Dupre equation. And Young's equation says okay, I've got a surface and I've got a liquid on it. And there's going to be some wetting angle, theta. And all Young's equation is, is a balance of forces in the horizontal direction. So you can derive Young's equation. If this is the solid, the liquid, oops, that's not the solid up there. That's the vapor. That's the liquid. And here's the solid. I say that if I resolve these forces, there's only one pulling to your right, and that's the surface tension of the solid vapor equals horizontally the surface tension of the liquid, of the liquid solid plus the surface tension of the liquid vapor cosine of theta. All I've done is resolve this one into its horizontal component by cosine of theta. That's Young's equation, or sometimes called the Young Dupre equation. You'll find it in any book on adhesive bonding. We're going to use it when we get to soldering. It is one of the simplest and most under misunderstood equations in the world of science. Uh, the more you study, and think about Young's equation, the less you understand it. One of the problems that people have with it is Young's equation is an equation at equilibrium. So if I've got, I just waxed my car and the rain's on top of it, which is, that's one way to, if you need rain, you wax your car, right? Um, and it will rain. And the water on the wax car is going to have a high, high surface energy or not high surface energy, but it's going to it's going to beat up, and it'll have a high value of theta because wax is a nonpolar polymer, and water is a polar liquid, and the two of them don't have similar bonding. They don't like each other. The interfacial energy between the liquid and the solid is relatively high, um, and so you end up with a relatively large value of theta. If I have some contamination on the surface, or what we call a surface active element, uh, some stearate or something like that, then I will essentially end up um, with a low interfacial energy between the liquid and the solid, and the water will spread out, spread out across there. And when I'm doing dishwash, when I'm using uh, the dishwasher, automatic dishwasher, I add these wetting agents for a, a fancy price and all they're doing is contaminating the surface of the glass with something that has an, affi an affinity for the water. And therefore, instead of forming little beads like waxing your car does, it causes the water to sheet over the surface and doesn't leave the dirt behind in little clumps that you can see. It spreads it out uniformly so you can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mercury is fun to play with, except it's toxic, right? Now, if you want to play with something that's fun, it's kind of like mercury, use gallium. The only problem with gallium is gallium, gallium melts in your hand, not in your mouth. Um, or no, it melts in your mouth, not in your hand? No, anyway. Um, anyway, gallium melts at 23 degrees centigrade. So if you take a piece of gallium uh, and put it in your hand, it will melt. And it's not as toxic as mercury. It has a lower vapor pressure. Uh, I said it's not as toxic. 
heavy metals are toxic in any case, but gallium is not as toxic. So if you really want to play with something, play with gallium rather than mercury. It has a lower vapor pressure. Yeah, well, I mean, we used to, you know, we used to, we used to drop a mercury thermometer on the floor and just kind of sweep it up. Now you have to, you know, put some sulfur and other stuff on there to, to lower the vapor pressure because otherwise the mercury level, you'll just be breathing it. But hey, we used to do that all the time. What, what's a liver for, right? Other than clean, clean things out. There was another question? There's another question on this? Um, so anyway, you, the theta is a measure of the wetting of the surface. Low values of theta, good wetting. High values of theta, lousy wetting. Magic sand, lousy wetting with water. And if I had a clear thing, you could put the magic, you pour the magic sand in and you can build these little columns because the magic sand will actually, you can probably see it, will actually trap air with it. The, the little white stuff in there, that's air that got trapped because magic sand has a greater affinity for air than it does for water. Okay, for whatever that's worth. Sorry, it's just a nonpolar polymer. It's non-toxic. It, they don't tell you what it is. They tell you it's non-toxic. This is copyright 1980, 1988, 1981. Whammo Manufacturing Company. Uh, yeah, they make super balls. Although magic sand is regarded as non-toxic, it is re recommended that younger children use it under adult supervision. Okay, so. Don't eat it. Uh, I mean, it's non-toxic. You can eat it, but it'll give you blue stools or something. Uh, and if you if you ate a lot, it may not. You know, your body may not want something. It probably gives you gas, right? Because it picks up the the air, right? Other questions, other than about magic sand, which I have no great expertise for magic sand. Okay. Um, let's see what else we should say. Um, well, that's probably enough for today, okay? We'll finish up. Uh, I won't be here the next two days, but you can watch vid videos, and I will be here on Friday, and we'll finish uh, uh, some stuff on adhesive bonding. On